Hello, and welcome to Adapter Parish, episode 26, Fried Green Tomatoes. As always, before we jump in, let's talk about our next episode. On Tuesday, October 9th, we reach a milestone here at Adapter Parish, and we'd like you to celebrate with us. We didn't look at anything new, because in our next episode, we look back at the last year of the show, which also happens to be the show's first year. We, we did it! We, we did it! We, we did it! We'll be reading listener mail, reflecting on the best and worst adaptations of the year, and reflecting on this entire experience. We don't want you to miss it. If you have any comments, questions, or corrections that you'd like to hear on the show, remember to email adapterparishcast at gmail.com or tweet at us using the AdaptCast hashtag. And with that, on with the show. Fanny Flags, fried green tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe. Welcome to Adapter Parish, a podcast about adaptation. My name is Jeremy Latour. And I'm Aria Lipshaw. What's so, what's so funny? Uh, Jeremy has been playing, I guess you would call it the air jug. <laughs> Did you call it playing the jug? Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, play- Jeremy decided to play the air jug <laughs> all through the entire intro. Just so everybody knows, we do listen to our theme music live. Yeah, because we're that way. Uh, how, how are you doing? I'm okay. Are you looking forward to this episode? I, I am. I yep. am. It's it's one of those things where uh, you have a really sort of fond memory of something, and then you watch or read it again, or maybe both, and perhaps it doesn't live up to your cherished memory in every possible respect, and now you're a little bit nervous to talk about it. Would you say that in some ways you were kind of looking at the past through rose-colored glasses? Uh, You could say that. Maybe that's appropriate (laughs) for this episode? Perhaps. What are we talking about today, Jeremy? We are talking about Fanny Flagg's Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe, which was made into a movie called Fried Green Tomatoes. And we're talking about both of those. Yes. So what is your, uh, what, what was your sort of history or understanding of this, of this book and movie? I, this was one of those movies where like, or, or rather these books and movies mm-hmm. where I knew it was a book. Yeah. Like I know about Fanny Flag. Like when I worked at a bookstore, tons of people bought Fanny Flag books. And I remember, I guess I remembered that she wrote Fried Green Tomatoes, but it wasn't really like in my head. Yeah. But like the movie Fried Green Tomatoes, I know about. But you hadn't seen it. I'd never, I, I realized there was like one scene in it that I vividly remember watching Mm -hmm. but it was like the only scene that I saw I never Mm -hmm. actually watched the whole thing but I always knew it was one of those like oh yeah it's like early 90s it's like Kathy Bates and Jessica Tandy and some other uh, women are in it but I remember the two of them yes that's correct and and it was like really popular because it's just about relationships between women and a lot of them talking and about how much they mean to each other and love each other in in multiple time periods as well Mm mm-hmm I've definitely seen the movie before and remembered liking it a lot. And I had definitely read the book. Um, Fanny Flagg, I feel like I always get mixed up with um, Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, which is also okay. a book about like Southern women and friendship and is told from varying perspectives and multiple different generations. Um, so the, the, the similarities are there. Right. Uh, and I think I always think that like fanny flag wrote that or the author of that wrote this but they're two different people Mm -hmm. um so yeah i i had had let me just say i had had formative memories of this Mm -hmm. movie and remembered the book as being quite good formative the way like a perfect murder was for those who have listened to that episode a little bit a little bit (laughs) a little bit i well i had no memories of it yeah um i like Right off the bat, let's just say, obviously, spoiler alert, we're going to talk freely about different things that happen in this book and this movie. But there's the scene at the beginning of the movie when Chris O'Donnell dies. Yes. Robin himself dies because of a train. Batman Jr. Yeah. That, that's not how that works. <laughs> um, but he gets like his foot caught in a railroad track and then a train runs him down. Yeah. Like... I, if you had asked me, do you remember any of the movie Fried Green Tomatoes? I would have said, no, of course I don't remember any of it. I've never seen it. But then when we were watching it and that scene happened, I was like, oh, holy shit. Yes, I have watched well, this. Well, the funny thing is if someone had described that scene to you, you would have been like, you would have probably thought that was like what the movie was about. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Since that was like the one. Oh yeah, it's a, that movie about someone getting run over by a train. Right, and the whole rest of the movie is just about how sad everybody is that Chris O'Donnell's dead. Which it kind of is in a way. In a way. All right. Um. Well, before we proceed any further, yeah. What's this about? Let's let's talk about what it's about. Um. I think I would like you to read the back of the book. Oh, okay. So I have I have here a paperback copy that we paid uh, fifty cents for, I believe. Yeah. Uh, would you like me to do it in a southern accent? No, I would not. I think you that sure? is. I think that is offensive. Maybe I should do it twice. You should not. Flag's new novel is the Lake Wobegon of the South. <laughs> it is folk what stop fuck? laughing. It is folksy and fresh, oh endearing and affecting, filled with humor and drama, and has an ending that would fill with smiling tears the whistle stop lake. If only they had a lake, which is from the book. No, I know. This is really bad. Yeah, it's very like someone wrote this who isn't Fanny Flag. No, no, the book is well written. This is terrible. Yeah. Uh back to it. It's first the story of two women in the 1980s of gray-headed Mrs. Threadgood telling her life story to Evelyn who is in the sad slump of middle age. I like how it's not like a sad slump in middle age. It's like the sad slump of middle age. Yes, the the thing that everyone goes through. Oh yes, that well-known slump. The tale she tells is also of two women, of the irrepressibly daredevilish tomboy Iggy and her friend Ruth, who back in the 30s ran a little place in Whistle Stop, Alabama, a Southern Cafe Wobegon offering. What? Yeah. Okay, hang on. I got to read that again. A Southern Cafe Wobegon offering good barbecue and good coffee and all kinds of love and laughter, even an occasional murder. What the? Like this they don't actually have to say Wobegon twice. Like, like it I, has nothing to do with Lake Wobegon. I want to get this out of the way. I liked this book. Yeah. I had a lot of issues with this book, but I liked this book. This is terrible. <laughs> this is like the worst. This is the worst back of the book I think we've ever read. This is awful. Yeah. I will say, um, just to get this out of the way, tomboy and friend are both code. Yeah. Well, the other thing I love about the back of this is uh, there's a bunch of quotes for some, from some other people. Okay. One from Harper Lee. Oh. Yeah. A richly comic, poignant narrative. That's that was what from Har- Harper Lee's agent. Harper uh, Lee was not doing book blurbs. Harper Lee was famously reclusive. Here's the deal. Remember how I told you beforehand that I had a quote that I wanted to read? Yeah. It was a Harper Lee quote. Okay. About this book. Do you want to do that now? I might save it for a minute unless you want to get right into it and talk about how these two women are friends. <laughs> um, no. Maybe we should hold off Let's for a hold minute. off. Let's come to that naturally. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the plot of this book because mm-hmm. I feel like it's it's a little bit complicated and I think that it's going to be important when we come to talk about the movie that we've sort of fully gone through the plot yeah. of the book because I, they're a little bit different. Yeah, I think the first thing we need to talk about is the structure of the book. Yeah. Do you mind if I go into that for a no, second? No, go ahead. So basically the book is structured in an interesting way. It jumps back and forth in time a lot, but also in viewpoint. Yeah. So for example, half the book is taking place in the late 1980s in Alabama at a retirement home. Yes. And and thereabouts. Thereabouts. And the, it's it's all conversations that are happening between uh, Ninny Threadgood. Mm-hmm. Who's and, an old lady. And Evelyn Couch. Who is a middle-aged slumping lady. Yes. Yeah. We would call her slumping. Yeah. She, she does tend to slump. And we see Evelyn meet Ninny at the beginning of the book, mm-hmm. meet Mrs. Threadgood, and they form a relationship. And the entire book is kind of framed around this, where we have Ninny Threadgood telling about what Whistle Stop Alabama was like. Yes. And about certain characters and telling Evelyn about this. Yes. Um, however, the the thing that I think is really interesting, though, is that that's really... The, the author doesn't take the framing device of Ninny telling this story so literally as to say, well, everything that we are going to learn about these characters is from Ninny's perspective. She definitely goes much more um, omniscient narrator when she goes back into the past, which is really cool because it lets us learn a lot of different things that even Ninny wouldn't necessarily know or yeah. have known. Like viewpoints are a really big part of this book. Yeah. There's like three narrators in this book. So, right. So not not only is it from different perspectives, there are almost different um, forms of media because a lot of it is like clippings from the old like gossip column of the old newspaper that's written by a woman named dot weems yeah um the weems weekly the weems weekly and we learn a lot from that about stuff that would have been going on in the town um and the other part that if you have only seen the movie and haven't read the book you might be a little bit surprised is it goes way more in depth 
in the lives of both the white characters and the black characters. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is a little town in Alabama in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Mm -hmm. And so all of these sort of elements of racial tension and violence and oppression and discrimination that you might expect are there in that in that town um we're given to understand given that to they understand. are present even though it's not always examined well we're going to talk about that in a minute yeah um but the thing that i want to be clear is that like there's one story especially of like one family and one son from one black family from that town that like is totally from his perspective like nini would never have had any knowledge of like what artist pv's life was like in right. birmingham you, do, do you know what i yeah, mean the only stuff that's from ninny's perspective are the chapters where ninny is telling evelyn about what she knows right but then we also see just to kind of go into a little bit more so we see those chapters that's probably about half the book then almost half another half of the book is kind of this omniscient narrator telling the story of two other characters ruth and iggy right who i think I'll hold off on for a second. Yeah. We'll get to them in a moment. And then, and those all take place, like you said, in the like 20s and 30s. Yeah. Mostly in the 20s and 30s. Yeah. Well, it, went, it goes all the way up to the uh, 50s because the murder trial is in yeah. the 1950s. Totally. So it's it's a it's a broad expanse of time. Oh, wait. We just said murder trial. Oh, did, no. did we get your attention? Yeah. Um, but then there's also sprinkled throughout it, there is the Weems Weekly, which are these short like one page sections where Dot Weems is kind of telling whoever's reading it what's going on in the town yes so you might read a whole chapter that's about a thing that happened and then immediately following that is the entry from the weems weekly that mentions the thing you just spent a chapter reading about right but maybe has a different perspective on it or doesn't have all of the details um that the chapter has because there's a lot of sort of secrets and lies in in this yeah. town um so and and then the other part of it too is in the 1980s Evelyn's sort of transformation and change and the way that she's affected by meeting this this old woman and learning about all of these things that happened in this town and how she kind of improves her life so to speak. Yes. So let's talk about the characters. Mm-hmm. The ones you already mentioned are Evelyn Couch and Ninny. Um those are from the 1980s. Evelyn's husband Ed who is just kind of a guy, like a man's man. You know, Mm -hmm. he's just super oblivious, like just old school guy that likes to watch sports and go fishing and does not spend a lot of time... Pleasuring uh, his wife. Pleasuring his wife. I think those are all the major characters from from the 1980s. That's that's pretty much... There's certainly other characters that are mentioned. Like, one of the reasons why Nini Threadgood is even in the nursing home is because she's there with uh, her friend Mrs. Otis. Right, that's right. And she says that multiple times. She's like, well, I'm only here because Mrs. Otis is here. Right. And then when Mrs. Otis dies, Nini leaves. Right. Um, but yeah, there really aren't any other characters that really have a perspective that we get to hear from. It really is. And even, even Evelyn's husband is like a very minor character yeah it really is about evelyn and ninny right um so then we get these flashbacks into the life of this town called whistle stop alabama and all of these characters i think the strength of the writing in this book is the way that the characters are really described and created you can really you can really see them you know a lot about them you know what all of their relationships to each other are um so the main sort of prominent family in the town is the Threadgood family because it's Ma and Pa Threadgood and they have like six kids Mm -hmm. one of whom and one of their Ninny marries one of their sons so that's why her last name is is Threadgood Mm -hmm. Uh, but she wasn't one of the the children of the of the family so there's the oldest brother named Buddy there's uh, the older sister who's not very important Um, there's a couple of middle brothers and then the youngest kid is uh, a little girl named Iggy yep and the great tragedy in I- Iggy's life happens when she is about 12. Something like that, yeah. yeah. And her brother, Buddy, who she loves and adores, her older brother, um, who's 18 or so, um, gets killed by the train. The, 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 the train is really, really an important symbol in this town. I mean, it's called Whistle Stop. Um, and the, the life of the town is really tied to the life of the train. And we learn at the end of the book that when the train stopped running, the town really died like Mm -hmm. nobody nobody was left um and so the train is really important symbol in the book but the train is also the thing that ends up killing uh buddy and what we learn about iggy is that she's 
Uh, she's always been a tomboy. She never liked to wear dresses. She likes to wear like boys clothes and she likes to climb trees and play sports like she's she's your typical tomboy. Um, and, but we also uh, the other thing we learn is that Buddy's death affects her so much that she basically stops living with her family from from them then on and like goes down to this like moonshine and jazz club by the river where her friends live and just like lives there for her entire teenage years but she still has a relationship with her family oh yeah like she loves them she just like basically has decided she can't be part of society anymore so the other thing that we know about iggy is that iggy is in love Mm -hmm. and the person that what's his name the person that she is in love with is a beautiful human being Mm-hmm. whose name is Ruth Jameson. Oh, goodness. And Ruth is some distant cousin of the family, and she comes to town one summer to teach Sunday school. And she's about 20, 21, and Iggy's about 15 or 16. And Iggy just falls super hard for Ruth. This is like the summer of 1920 or something mm-hmm. like that. And the cool thing about how that relationship is depicted in the book is that the family is like, yeah, yeah, Iggy's got a crush on this girl. Like, we're cool they, with that no, they don't say she has a crush they say she's in love no they say well they, it starts out by saying do you remember her ruth go, she won't come down from her room and ruth goes up to get her and the mother says to all of the kids children your sister has a crush and i don't want anyone to make fun of her yeah 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 uh, but then yes you're right like later on it's like oh no she's they're in love with each other mm-hmm. she's in love with ruth and ruth is in love with iggy yeah um and the sort of climactic scene where they both realize that they're in love with each other is uh, Iggy takes Ruth out to this field where there's a, a bee tree and she goes and she um, gets honey from the tree with all the bees flying around without getting stung. And it's really like this really cool moment. And Ruth says, Iggy, you're a bee charmer. Well, well, that's not all that happens because yes. Iggy goes and does this thing. But the entire time she's doing it, Ruth is freaking the fuck out. Mm-hmm. And when she gets back to her, Ruth is in tears. Right. And she's saying, like, what are you crying for? I'm fine. She's like, I don't know what I would do if anything ever happened to you. Right. And that's... Right. And the narration says something like that was the moment where Ruth knew that she would... She loved Iggy more than anything in the world. Like, it yeah. says it as explicitly as that. Right. Now, one thing that... I, I think we should just start talking about it now. Yeah. We're not going to finish this right now. Yeah. We're going to talk about this for the rest of this episode. Yeah. Ruth and Iggy are in love and in a relationship. For the entire book. Yes. L- that lasts from like when Ruth is 20 years old until she dies. Right. They're not friends. They're not friends. They I mean, are, they are friends, but of course they they're are. more well, than friends. You and I are friends. Right. They're friends in the way that you and I are friends. Yeah. In that we are married to each other and enjoy a romantic relationship. Right. They are in a romantic relationship. Yes. And it couldn't, like, it's one of those things where, yeah, I guess if you were reading it and you just absolutely did not want to think of it that way, yeah, you could come out of it saying, no, they're best friends. They are really close and they are friends, but that is not what's happening. Yeah. That's a really, that's that's kind of hard for me to understand. That, that would be a difficult reading to justify. Yeah. So now that we've gotten this out of the way, I want to read that quote that I was talking about. This is Harper Lee. Great. I love this. Airplanes and television have removed the thread goods from the southern scene. Happily for us, Fanny Flagg has preserved a whole community of them in a richly comic, poignant narrative that records the exuberance of their lives, the sadness of their departure. Iggy Threadgood is a true original. Huckleberry Finn would have tried to marry her. Oh my god. Good luck, Huck. I don't think I don't think you're her type. He would have tried. He definitely would have tried. But I just love the fact that like even Harper Lee reading this book is going to go to the place where where Iggy would have ended up in a you know quote unquote straight relationship That's with right. another fictional character That's who was right. a man. Right. We're going to talk about this. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to continue. Mm-hmm. Um you may be asking why are we placing such an emphasis on this? <laughs> like what difference does it make if that's what the book is about? That's our show. That's our show. So Ruth has a problem. She has a terrible problem, Mm -hmm. which is that she is engaged to be married to a man named Frank Bennett. Yes. And she has to go home to Valdosta, Georgia at the end of the summer and marry uh, Frank. And the problem with Frank is that he is a piece of shit. Yeah. (laughs) And no one should marry him. And he's the worst. Mm -hmm. Um, But he's very rich and he's very prominent in town. And she said she would. And she has to take care of her widowed mother. And so that is what she does. And Iggy basically loses her mind. Yep. And goes back to the river and doesn't come home 
ever again. And that's also where we learn, by the way, that Iggy has a explicitly sexual relationship with a woman named Eva Bates, who was actually also Buddy's girlfriend when he was alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we learn she's that popular. She's 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 free and easy with her body. Uh-huh. Um, but she's also not sk- when she's in a relationship. No, though. she's she's skilled in the art of loving. Yeah, she's a serial monogamous. That's well, perhaps some of her her monogamous relationships don't last very long. No. Yeah. But they are monogamous. Okay. I, I just liked that. I liked that aspect of her character. I found that interesting. It's good. It's good. Anyway, um, but it's just interesting that the author, Fanny Flagg, wrote that scene. She wrote that character and then later said, oh, no, it's, it's just not. I mean, this is just about female friendship. Like, I, I guess I don't understand how you can have that disconnect with something that you yourself wrote and are able to like say with a straight face no that's just an interpretation that somebody put on it in case you're wondering why we're getting so angry about this it's because that this is like an iconic lesbian character that the author has disavowed can i read this quote yeah go ahead okay so this is from fanny flag no 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 it's a story about love and friendship the sexuality is unimportant in the book all the relationships are very close and people can draw whatever conclusions they want that's what you hope for when you write a book we are looking at them from 1991, the 30s, which is when she said this. The 30s was a totally different time period. There were very warm friendships between women. Okay, Fanny. Counterpoint. Yeah. I'm going to read you something from the book. Okay. At about three o'clock that morning, Eva said, come on. And putting Iggy's arm around her shoulder, she took her over to her cabin and put her in the bed. Eva couldn't stand to see anything hurt that bad. She sat down beside Iggy, who was still crying, and said, now, sugar, I don't know who you're crying over, and it doesn't really matter, because you're going to be all right. Hush up now. You just need somebody to love you. That's all. It's going to be all right. Eva's here. And she turned off the lights. Eva didn't know about a lot of things, but she knew about love. Iggy would live down at the river, on and off, for the next five years. Eva was always there when needed, just like she had been for Buddy. Who she had a sexual relationship with. Correct. Like, yeah. I... I'm literally, like, I'm basically, I'm sitting here speechless, which is yeah. not great pod. You're but a gape. <laughs> I'm Mouth a gape. I'm Mouth a gape. Like, how do you say it's open to interpretation, but you wrote that? I yeah. don't understand. I, I just wonder how much of it is kind of a backlash she got from certain people yeah. who maybe didn't want to read that. I think there's a, a huge amount of people who are totally ready for that and want to want to read something like that. Yeah. And I think there's also a good amount of people who probably love this book who don't ever want them to be anything more than friends. Yeah, which and, is upsetting. And Iggy's just a tomboy. Yeah. Um, she just needs the right man. It's really upsetting. I'm not that's not what I'm saying. I did not think it was. That's that's what I I can easily imagine someone saying that. So I guess what it really comes down to for me, I really enjoyed this book. Yeah. Like this book is a really, really fun read, but I have these kind of two groups of issues. One is the issues that I have with the book. Yes. Which uh, there's also another big one that we haven't really gotten we'll into. Get to, we'll get to it. We're coming to it. But actually the way that Iggy and Ruth's relationship is presented, that's not actually something I have a, a problem with. No. The, I like it's, that. It's great in the book. But the, what I don't like is the other group of issues that I have with it, which is just what people outside <laughs> side the book have said about the book and later about the movie yeah so for example the way fanny flag has kind of disavowed any kind of any view of Iggy being gay yeah basically and like yeah i don't know what her sexuality is but like, she clearly has romantic feelings and relationships with and towards women yeah like you don't have to and i think that's like maybe what fanny flag in a way is responding to which is I don't want to put a label on anybody's sexuality, but saying it in a really clumsy way. And if that's actually what she's saying, I don't have a problem with it because sexuality is a rich tapestry and I don't have any problem with saying you really shouldn't label someone as a lesbian when they don't self-identify in that way. Sure. And we can't know how they would have self-identified with the language of today, Mm -hmm. whatever today may be. Especially when they're a fictional character. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what makes me kind of okay with it. Yeah. If, if this was a real person, I would be much, much more conservative about any kind of labels. Right. But but Iggy being fictional, I think, makes it a little more okay. I mean, like, let me put it this way. Yeah. Iggy's gay. She's that's what gay. I, that's what I said. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. I'm just trying to be, I'm trying to be open-minded. Yeah. About 
labeling people. Mm -hmm. Let's, I want to backtrack for a second because there is the other thing that we need to talk about, kind of the whole other aspect of it. So before we go any further, let's, do you want to talk more about like the plot? Yeah, yeah. Let me keep going. Because we're really just on these two characters, but there is more stuff that happens. Yeah, yeah. So let me keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll try to be brief. (laughs) We Um, always try. So as we just read in that little uh, quote, Iggy lives down at the river for five years. And one day... In a van down by the river. In a shack down by the river. Okay. And then one day, uh, the Threadgood household receives a message. And it's just a page torn from the Bible. And it's a quote from the Book of Ruth about whither thou be I also shall. Your prep game is really (laughs) impressing me right now. It's a thing about the Ruth and she came with the thing and... It's from the book of Ruth, and the character's name is Ruth. I'll, I'll read it right here. I apologize for everyone that I don't sound like James Earl, James Earl Jones, who I feel like is the only person who can read the Bible. Whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. So they get a page from the Bible, yep. and that's on it. Yeah, which which is really, it's clearly telling Iggy, like, you've got to come get me. I need to be with y'all. Yes, correct. Um, and, well, there's a really sweet moment where Iggy says to her mother, what do you think this means? And her mother says, I think you better take your brothers and go over to Georgia and get that girl. Yeah. Like, her mother knows that Iggy's in love with Ruth. Like, it's super sweet. Mm-hmm. And then when, so she goes and brings Ruth home. It turns out Ruth, um, her mother died and basically died begging her to get away from Frank Bennett because by then she realized he's a monster. Yeah. Um, and he had been incredibly abusive. Yeah, to be clear, like yeah. he was physically abusing her. Yes. Let's let's be clear let's about be clear. that. And uh when they get back to Alabama, it turns out Ruth is pregnant mm-hmm. and has a baby, and Iggy and Ruth raised the baby together yeah. as their own. Well, there's this amazing scene where Ruth sits down with Iggy's parents and says, basically, I'm gonna do my best to take care of her and I'm I'm here and I'm not going anywhere and Iggy's father says to Iggy like well now that you have Ruth and a baby to take care of I'd better give you five hundred dollars to start this cafe like this is a relationship Mm -hmm. that is being clearly formed and supported by Iggy's parents there's a moment later that I really like so uh the son I forget what his actual name is buddy uh buddy oh yeah it's also Buddy. buddy junior right uh, he's also in a train accident. Right. He only loses his arm, though. Right. Um, and they call him Stump. Yeah, from then on. So I only remember him as Stump. Um, there's a, a moment where we hear the Weems Weekly. <laughs> I love the Weems Weekly. And she refers to him as Iggy and Ruth's son. Yeah, Iggy and Ruth's little boy. And this is a community newspaper. Like this in is the, the com- 1930s. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone knows yeah and everyone's cool with it yeah we can only assume because we don't see anyone who isn't cool with it like not one person yeah it's very strange and this is a book that has the clan in it <laughs> that's, but it's true yeah correct but ruth and Iggy's relationship is not what they're there for uncontroversial so who are some other characters that are in this book okay so there is a family that works for the Threadgood family. Mm-hmm. Well, Sipsy is the matriarch. Sip- Sipsy is the matriarch. She is the one that cooks all the food yeah. at the Whistle Stop Cafe, mm-hmm. except for her son, Big George, who does the barbecue. Right. And Big George is married to a woman named Anzel. Mm-hmm. And Anzel also works at the cafe. They have a little girl named Naughty Bird, and they have three sons, a uh, wonderful counselor, which is an amazing name, who yep. they call Willie Boy, and Jasper and Artis. Yeah, and Artis and Willie Boy are twin brothers. Artis and Willie Boy are twin brothers. Yep. Right. Um, and... All of them kind of get a storyline. Artist grows up and moves to Birmingham, Alabama and becomes kind of like into like the jazz scene and like kind of a flashy guy. And um, Willie Boy gets killed in a fight, I believe, at some point. Yeah, Yeah, which is really sad. And Jasper uh, works on the trains and becomes a Pullman porter and like marries and has kids and all of his kids go to college and become really successful. Mm -hmm. Not sure what happens to Naughty Bird. But Naughty Bird meets an elephant. Yes. I do know that. What's the elephant's name? Miss Fancy. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Naughty Bird's adorable. Naughty Bird's really cute. She's in far too little of the book. Naughty Bird is the only one of those children that's in the movie. She doesn't even have any lines, but she is in the movie. That's true, yeah. J- just observing. Yep. Um. So Iggy and Ruth live together. They raise this kid. They have this cafe. It's very famous for the barbecue and for their pie. And then something very tragic happens. Which is that Ruth dies. Yes. And then, years after that, a man turns up dead. And it turns out that that man is Frank Bennett. 
and Iggy because she was heard to threaten to kill him when she went over to Valdosta, Georgia to uh, abscond with Ruth is put on trial for his murder. Well, in the book, it's before she even goes over to take Ruth. Because in the book, she's oh, like... Oh, right, right, right. When it, she threatens to kill him, you mean. Yeah, in the book, basically, she goes to where they live and is spying on them, and Ruth never knows that she's there. But she hears from someone about what this guy Bennett is doing to his wife, and so she runs into like where he's getting his hair cut. He's getting and just, a shave. And in front of the entire barbershop just goes like, Frank Bennett, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. And like. It, that was a good impression. Thank you. Um, and then she leaves. And Ruth never really knows about that. Yeah. But then he goes missing. Right. And he goes missing before Ruth dies. Oh, yeah. Years and, before. And there are cops that come and question, uh, you know, Iggy and a whole bunch of people around there because they knew he was heading in that direction. They never make head nor tail of it. But then later after Ruth dies, then they find out. They find his car. Uh, yeah. They, they actually never do find his body remember because he's got that glass eye well they never find his body someone at some point finds his head yeah in the 60s they find his head but this was after the trial she can't be tried twice frank bennett being dead is brought up multiple times through this book first he's missing then they have his head and then we as readers find out what happened to the rest of him and how he died but it's kind of like it's a story that's doled out over the course of the book, which is really appropriate. It's very interesting. Because that's that's the original thing that makes Evelyn interested in Ninny's story. Right. Because she's, she's just like this rambling old woman. And she's like, did you ever hear of someone named Iggy Threadgood? And Evelyn's going, no, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. And she did this. And she did that. And she did this. But how they could have ever thought she killed that man is beyond me. And then Evelyn's like, wait, what? And that's in chapter one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and that's the thing that makes the reader kind of understand why Evelyn wants to keep finding out. Right. And as they go through the book, Evelyn is literally asking her, it's like, no, you need to tell me about the dead guy. Yeah. What happened with the dead guy? And and we don't find out as readers until like really the very, very yeah. end. So what it turns out, what did happen to him is that he came back to Whistle Stop. There's a whole Ku Klux Klan element of this. That's that not even really in I don't the book, know that though. We, it is, though. He a comes bit. He comes with the Georgia boys, the the Ku Klux Klan yeah. boys. And, the, and he gets run out of town by their sheriff, who is also in their Ku Klux Klan, uh, which is different from the movie. We're going to talk about race in a second. Yep. I'm just going to finish the plot really quick. Uh-huh. He comes over. He tries to take the baby while everybody's away. Sipsy's there. She's an old lady. She tries to stop him. He whacks her in the face. She falls down. He keeps going with the baby. Unbeknownst to him, she wakes up. She whacks him in the head with a cast iron pan, and he dies. Cracks open his skull. He was dead before he hit the ground. That's right. I remember the, that piece she, of prose. And then she's like, I have killed myself a white man. I am in trouble. Yep. Um, and then uh, what they do is they take him, and they- You're butch- just going to tell everyone what they did. Yeah, they ate You're him. just going to say it like it's okay. They ate him. Yeah. They made him into barbecue they and They buried him. his head. Yes. And then I don't- Well, they, she buried his head. No, they didn't eat him. They sold, They served him to, to the, the police, customers. To the police. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It's fucked up. They, you they, don't eat people. You do, don't eat people. Well, what are they supposed to do with him? He's a bad guy. Do something, anything other than eating him because you don't eat people. But they did eat him. I appreciate that. In the world of fiction, I appreciate that they did that. But I have a hard line on this one. You don't eat people. Do you know they call that the custom of the sea? The custom of the sea is eating people? Yes, it's cannibalism. Well, I'm glad I live on land. It's the custom of the sea. I don't want to, I don't cotton to that. There, there is apparently a distinction morally drawn at sea between killing someone specifically to eat it, eat them and waiting until they die and then eating them if you're lost at sea. This is going in a direction I don't feel comfortable with. <laughs> because the sea. I don't want to know whether I'm capable of that. So I'd rather just move on. Oh, I would absolutely eat a person. Great. So moving on. <laughs> I'm glad we all know that now. I wouldn't kill anyone to eat them. Let me be clear. I wouldn't kill them specifically for the purpose of eating them. This just bothers me because of all the people in this world that you would probably be most likely to eat if they die is me. Yeah. We spend a lot of time together. Yeah. I don't want to talk about this. Great. Okay. That's you don't fine. eat people. Well, that's where I'm coming down on this. Anyway, Frank I'm not going to take such a hard moral line. Frank dies. And that's like a huge part of the book. They eat him. And that, basically, how does it end? Like where are we? Where do we sit in okay. the eighties? Where is where are all the characters when the book is finished? How have all their stories concluded? Evelyn has become liberated. Yep, she's now a Mary Kay lady. Mm-hmm. Which of the problems of this book is, uh, you know, it exists but is on a lower level to the racism that we're about to get into. Would you say that that issue would have was like multi level? Oh no, 
Yeah. Oh, no. Why? I guess they didn't really think about multi-level marketing back in the 80s the way we do today. I don't think they do. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Threadgood is dead. Yes. She has died. Uh-huh. Uh, she's very old, and she died. Yeah. And Can Angie, I talk about that for a second? Yeah. So Nitty Threadgood dies, and I th- basically there's two there's two deaths in the book that I think are handled particularly well in terms of how poetic they are. Mm-hmm. They are certainly not the only two people who die in the book. Right. There are quite a number of deaths in the book. Yes. But these two in particular really stuck with me. One is Ruth and one is Ninny. Yeah. First of all, with Ninny, I really appreciate the fact that Evelyn doesn't she it's not one of these things like Evelyn is there. She finds out about it later. Oh, she's like a fat spa. Yeah. Yeah. And she finds out that Ninny passed away. Yeah. And it's one of these things where Ninny, uh, she was at the re- at the nursing home because of her friend, Mrs. Otis. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Otis died. So she went home and died in her sleep at home. Yeah. And there, the thing I like about it is, yes, Evelyn is sad, but there's nothing really sad about the death other than she kind of misses her friend now. Right. But there's nothing tragic about a 90 year old woman dying in her own home. Right. You know, with people that care about Mm -hmm. her. And the the whole thing at the end of the book is that Ninny has left Ruth a box. Right. And inside the box are like pictures of all the people she's been telling her stories about and different artifacts and things like that. It's a really, really nice kind of literary death. Mm -hmm. And it's very realistic. Yes. That's the way these things happen. Like a lot of times when you find out that someone has passed away, you, you find it out and you have to deal with it emotionally, but it's not like you have viewing their big dramatic death hanging over your head. Right. Things like that do happen right. in this world, but this is one of the this is one of the multitude of deaths that isn't like that. Right. It really struck me as being very it's, realistic. It's not dramatic. It's just a realistic way of how often people just die. Who are ninety? Yeah. Who are yeah. ninety? Yeah. yeah. Like that's what happens. The other death is Ruth's, though. Right. And some one of the things I really appreciated about Ruth's death is that so she dies from cancer mm-hmm. well, very quickly. She dies. Well, Sipsy, Sipsy uh, euthanizes her. No, that's true. Yeah. But she was going to die from oh, cancer. Oh, 100%. Like, it's not malicious. It's yeah. because she was in terrible pain. Her body was riddled with lots of cancer. Yes. And so Sipsy helps along at the very end. Yes. But I, I'm i happy to say that, and I'm not happy to say, I'm perfectly willing to say that Ruth dies from cancer. She dies from cancer. Yeah. yeah, Sipsy would not have done that had she not been dying of cancer. It's one of these things where clearly she has been cut down sooner than anyone would have wanted. Yes. And certainly sooner than she deserved. The thing that I appreciate most about it is that it happens about halfway through the book. Yes. So you as a reader, you know what is going to happen to Ruth. And as time goes on and there is more and more story that involves Ruth, you know what the end of her story is before you get to the end of the book. Right. And that to me is also incredibly realistic because you find out about Ruth's death from the perspective of Nini telling Evelyn. Right. And if you ever talk to someone who's telling you about everything that ever happened in their life, they're not telling it to you in this perfect narrative structure around quote unquote characters. They're telling you about all the things that happened and they may jump around a little bit, just like the way the book jumps around in time. Well, and also if you're talking to someone about someone else who died 40 years ago, the first thing you're going to know about them is that they died 40 years ago. Yeah, Like that doesn't negate the fact that they have an interesting life story, but that's always kind of there hanging over it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So those are, I really appreciate the way those two deaths are handled in the book. But anyway, um, that, yes, Yes, no, just one last, very last thing. Mm -hmm. There's like an epilogue to the book that is really, really great. And in that epilogue, we find out that Iggy is still alive. Mm -hmm. She's living with her brother, Julian, and she's still charming bees. Yep. And and collecting honey. She's Mm -hmm. still a bee charmer. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's really sweet, and I'm going to get a little choked up thinking about it. Well, there's another while you while you're, while you're crying. Great. There's another thing I want to talk about as far as a reveal goes for Iggy. Yeah. So throughout the book, but pretty much early on in the book, there's a character that's introduced that we never meet called Railroad Bill. Right. So oh, yes, yes, yes. The yes, yes. train runs through town, and I think it's going to be a good bridge to talk about the other big thing about the book that we need to <laughs> the talk thing about. That we have glossed over so far. Yeah. The train runs through town, but the town isn't just Whistle Stop. The town is also Troutville, which is the other side of town, and that's where all the black people live. The the wrong side of the tracks. Quote, unquote. Yeah, oh, of course. No, we don't think that. No. Quote, unquote. 
The wrong side of the tracks. But I'm just saying, like, literally the wrong side of the tracks. One of the things that all the people in the town know about is Railroad Bill. And Railroad Bill is like a Robin Hood type figure Mm -hmm. who boards the train and throws, like, government supplies off the train. Government cheese. Food and coal and stuff like that. Yeah. And everyone in the town loves him because they're all super poor and he literally saves lives. But nobody knows who he is and they all, everyone thinks he's a black man. Yes. Yeah. That is the image everyone has in their head. Yeah. You find out, the reader finds out later in the book that Railroad Bill is itchy. Yeah. And I, it remind me, like, n- even Ninny doesn't know nobody that. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Not right. one person. But you as the reader know. Yeah. So there's information you have that Ninny doesn't have. Yes. And I want to, I'm saying that for two reasons. One, we have to talk about this other thing. And two, this is going to come up later in the movie. Yeah. So. Let's talk about the other thing. And then we'll talk about the movie. Let's talk about some people of a certain common characteristic yeah let's talk about black people in this book okay there it's bad it's not good it's not sorry yeah it's not good it's it's not this book you know what this book really reminded me of Mm -hmm. it reminded me of the book um the help yeah and basically that is a white woman author Mm -hmm. waxing nostalgic about the way things used to be and how the relationship, the personal relationships between white and black people were really so great. And we didn't have to let any of that nasty politics affect us and and our relationships with, I'm going to put this in strong quotes, our black people. Right. Do, do you know what I mean? Can I read a quote really quickly? Yeah, absolutely. This is from Fanny Flagg. Oh, God. When I started to write this book, it was in the 80s and we were going through kind of a rough time in the world and i thought i'd like to get i'd like to kind of get back to where people were nice to each other even though the country was going through a hard time people pulled together and it really did pull people together black white poor rich i think it was my own personal longing to get back to that kind of world that made me want to recreate it this is like i don't think anyone listening needs us to talk about what's wrong with this viewpoint well, let me say something. But we're going to do it anyway. Well, let me just say something kind of funny. Yeah. Um, one book that we have really wanted to do for this show and that we've been asked to do is The Color Purple. <laughs> and we have had a real hard time with it. We tried. We tried. And there's a couple problems that we personally, as us human beings, have had, which is that we just feel very strongly that Alice Walker's story is not our story to tell Mm -hmm. as it's not our story to pull apart and examine no and and not only that yes that and also it's a bummer it's a bummer Mm -hmm. um so it just it's funny because we thought we were going to be doing the color purple around this time and I said Let's do let's let's do something that has kind of similar themes because it's got these sort of themes of women and their sexuality and it's set in the South and it's all this and it'll be a lot easier for us to talk about. <laughs> let's do fried green tomatoes. And this is this is my th- I mean, this is clearly my bias from reading this as a child being much further back in the spectrum of waking, I suppose. I didn't remember any of this. And it's super fucking problematic. It's yeah. really upsetting. Mm-hmm. It's really upsetting to read a book where a white woman portrays... When you say a white woman... Are, so you're talking I'm about talking Fanny about the Flagg. Author. I'm okay, talking about gotcha. the author, Fanny Flagg, yep. portrays race and the relationship between races in this way. Mm-hmm. Because we're talking about a time period, and we see this in the movie, We're talking, and, and in the book too, we are literally talking about characters who are in the Ku Klux Klan who are supposed to be sympathetic. Mm-hmm. Like, that's impossible. That's not okay. That's not acceptable. And it wasn't in the 80s either. Mm-hmm. So like, it's it was just a harsh dose of reality to hear you read that quote for her to say, yeah, my motivation for writing this book was to take us back to a simpler time when... We didn't have all this trouble. And the Ku Klux Klan really weren't such bad guys. I mean, if that's really what she's trying to say, then that's horrifying. Yeah. No, it's just, it's it's always horrifying to me and super frustrating to hear anybody say life was better or life was simpler if they're referring to any time period pre-civil rights. Yeah. Like or that's, like pre- But specifically that. That's yeah. like a hard, that is a hard moment for me. Yeah. Like anything prior to that moment you have to be really careful with me if you're going to try to convince me that anything was better at that point. Yeah. 
because yeah, that because yeah, yeah. the civil rights movement needed to happen right so if it needed to happen maybe things weren't quite as um, this makes me so mad <laughs> yeah, the vein is coming out so mm. strongly in your forehead maybe things weren't quite as good as you would like me to believe that's why i couldn't watch Mad Men, mm-hmm. and i know it i know it actually got into examining this stuff critically in later seasons but it really like the first few episodes that I saw that I then couldn't watch anymore was lit because it was just, Oh no, it's just depicting how terrible it was. It's, it's not examining it critically. It's just telling me, it's just showing me all of these shitty people doing shitty things to women. Yeah. Like never mind black people. That didn't even happen until later. Like they, there wasn't, there weren't even any black people in the first season. Yeah. I, I think the only thing I would say that's different is that, I, it was at least clear to me from the beginning of Mad Men that the creators of the show were like, no, no, this is bad. We're going somewhere. Yeah, this is this is no, bad. No, I get it. I get yeah. it. And I understand that. It was just right. hard to watch. I know, totally. So that's the big thing about it. So I'll here's here's kind of my big takeaway from it. Yeah. And I, I remember stopping multiple times and like calling to you from the other room like, this thing just happened and I'm not okay with it. Yeah. Like that kept happening. And the big one that I remember is that Evelyn goes to a black church. Oh my God. Okay. And it's a transformative experience for her. Yes. And she starts to, she's suddenly like, well, I always, I was never racist, but like, like this is Fanny Flagg telling us about what's going on inside Evelyn's head and telling us about Evelyn. Like Evelyn was never racist and she never believed those things, but you know, she did. She definitely was not friends with black people and she definitely. Oh, well, that goes into detail about how she's frightened of black men. Yes. And And that's never that's never fixed. We're, we're supposed to kind of... Well, no, that's the thing. It is addressed in this scene. Right. Because this is the scene where suddenly she realizes, oh, black people are great. Yeah. And I shouldn't be afraid of them because they're great and they make such wonderful music and they're such warm people and they all greeted me and everything like that. And the thing that frustrated me so much about that is... This is the thing I yelled to you from the other room. It's yeah, like, yeah. black people in this country... A, don't need Fanny Flagg's validation. Right. And B, the fictional black people in this book certainly don't need Evelyn Couch's validation. That's right. They, the, the They've scene, had a hard enough time. The scene I compared it to for you is like, this is a weird one, but it reminded me of the scene in the Blues Brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those of you who have seen the Blues Brothers at the beginning of the movie, Jake and Elwood go to a, a black church in Chicago and they see the Reverend Cleophas James, who's played by James Brown. And he like sings a song and it's very exuberant and very wild. And the two of them have a transformed experience but the transformative experience they're having is completely separate from and in no way is designed to validate the experience of the people who are actually going to church right they don't give a shit about anything that jake and elwood blues are experiencing at no point do they need their validation they're on their own story whereas this is really i think designed in a different way yeah this is kind of designed to show the reader you, the reader, should know about how rich their culture is and how great these people but are. But like Fanny Flagg is not the person to tell that story is e- what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah, We're yeah, seeing yeah. it from such a narrow viewpoint. Yeah. The validation comes in a very narrow way. Right. It's like, these are great people. Have you heard the music they sing in <laughs> church? How could you not think that these are great people if you've, if, you, if you've heard the music they sing in church? And it's like, okay, yeah, it is great, but that's like one part of a really big culture that's very complex and also isn't your culture. Well, and also, like to kind of close the loop, is born out of suffering that was imposed on them by you, Evelyn Couch, and every person in your family tree that came before you. Yeah. Like, fuck you. Mm-hmm. Get out of their church. Right. Like, <laughs> it's really upsetting. Well, the moment that did that for me, there was sort of a similar moment, and I actually um, uh, highlighted it on my Kindle um, and made a little note. And the note... So, there's a moment where Evelyn is in the process of sort of uh getting woke i guess mm-hmm. um getting liberated yeah, like i want to be clear evelyn's in a much better place at the end of the book than she is at the beginning but but this is what i'm saying and and we're gonna it's not that much better because here's what i'm gonna say okay she she sort of has this revelation that women are put upon oh and yeah, i'm okay yeah, yeah. with fanny flag making that observation as a southern woman as a southern woman to talk about the ways in which southern women have historically had to conform to certain notions of femininity. Like that is a great story for Fanny Flagg to tell. That's awesome. That's a great thing for her to explore. But the way that Evelyn gets there is there's this whole paragraph that I am not going to read because it contains many slurs. Mm -hmm. But to paraphrase, it basically says, 
you weren't allowed to call black people names anymore and you weren't allowed to call Italian or Jewish people names anymore. And there's a list of what those names are. Mm -hmm. But why was it okay to continue to call like women bitches and whores? Like that's basically saying basically the, the point of it is why is it? And I don't agree with any of this. I'm just paraphrasing. But why is it okay to call women names, but it's not okay to call people, people of color or different races names? And what I wrote down was egregious example of non-intersectional feminism. Very 1980s. This is terrible. Mm-hmm. Because... Wait, you're telling me that some black people are also women? Shockingly, yes. Oh my goodness. I know. And I feel like... So if you've ever heard the word intersectional or intersectionality and you have been curious about what it means, um, this is a good example of something that is not that. <laughs> so it, if, if, you, if your feminism is not intersectional, it means that what you are doing is taking the concept of race and um, age, a, what, what, whatever it is. Right. And divorcing it, you, but usually race. Yes. And divorcing it from the uh, the concept of uh, gender, and ignoring, I suppose, the fact that racism and sexism are very frequently intertwined because there are many, 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 many people who inhabit an oppressive state both on the grounds of their race and the grounds of their gender. And so to say something like, why is it okay to insult, like literally what she's saying is, why is it okay to insult women but not black people? Well, women are also black people and you're just leaving that out of the equation whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And basically saying, if you if your identity is intersectional, you have to take a side. Uh, you have to either identify as a woman or as a black person because we as white feminists have nothing to do with the with the civil rights movement. We are we're all about feminism. Um, and that is it's an advanced concept, I suppose, on the spectrum of wokeness, um, but nevertheless, an important and a vital one, uh, especially for white people. Like because it is so easy. I'm, I mean, I'm literally saying like this is a book that I remembered fondly. Um, And it is so easy to ignore the experience of anyone who is not you and does not occupy the same rung of privilege as as you yourself do. And it, it is important as white people to call this shit out because unfortunately we have the privilege to be for our voices to be louder and to be and to be heard more and more recognized. Yes. Um, So. There, that's that's my that's my intersectionality rant, I guess, for the day. Class dismissed. <laughs> but we still have more to talk about. Oh my god, I'm tired. We've only been talking about oh, this. Oh, I'm book. so angry. Okay, so that's the book. <laughs> now, like, d- to be honest, it, this this episode is really just about a book and a movie. Yes. And unlike other episodes we've done, yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about the book. But a lot of everything we've talked about is stuff that really sets up things that we're going to spend less time talking about during the movie. But still exist. <laughs> but we need that foundation yes. for it. So let's talk about this movie a little bit. So the book came out in 1987, mm-hmm. and pretty much immediately, uh, the rights were snatched up. I want to say by Universal, because the movie came out. The movie was released by Universal, okay. and it came to director John Avnet. And it's just a little background hey, on this. I have a question about John Avnet. Yeah, is he a white man? Uh, yeah, great. He, yes. Uh, I don't see why that would matter. Uh, he <laughs> was a producer, and this was his first time directing. Here are some things that he produced. Okay. Not, not not all prior to this, but in his career. Uh, a, he produced Risky Business. He produced uh, the Mighty Ducks trilogy. Okay. He produced the Three Musketeers starring Chris O'Donnell okay. and Kiefer Sutherland and Charlie Sheen. I, I like that movie. George of the Jungle, When a Man Loves a Woman. Oh, my God. And as a director, he did this. He did The War with um, uh, Frodo. Elijah, Elijah Wood, Wood and Kevin Costner. Uh, he did 88 Minutes with Al Pacino. Oh my God. And Righteous Kill with Al Pacino and uh, Robert De Niro. Great. Which both of, like, his his post Fried Green Tomatoes movies that he's directed have not always been the most well received. But the thing that gets him a pass in my book is that he directed 10 episodes of Justified. There it is. Which I love so much. And Justified is probably going to come up again in a couple of minutes. Great. So. Uh, he came on, and basically the first draft of the script was written by someone named uh, uh, Carol Sobieski, okay. who best to, best that I could tell was not related to... Um, Lily? Lily Sobieski. Not her mom? No. Huh? Not related, it seemed like. The script that Carol wrote, guess what? 
What? It was a musical. Oh my god. She wrote a musical of this. No. That doesn't surprise me that much. No. I actually think that's not a terrible idea. I hate it. He didn't like it. I hate it. And so they said, well, who should we get to write the next draft? And they thought, Fanny Flagg. She got like 70 pages in and was like, this is not my thing. This is too difficult. I'm too attached to all of this. And so she dropped off. And John Avnet basically wrote the script himself. Okay. In like two, for two years, he was writing it. Great. Uh, there are some great people in this movie. Oh, like, yeah. Well, I mean, we talked about this while we were watching it. Like mm-hmm. we saw, we were like sort of paused it and Jessica Tandy and Kathy Bates were on screen. So Kathy Bates plays Evelyn and mm-hmm. Jessica Tandy plays Mrs. Threadgood. And I was like, I don't remember the exact sequence of events, but one of them had won the Academy Award for Kathy Bates had it won was, the yeah I know what it was okay so it was two years before yeah Jessica Tandy won the Academy Award for, for driving, driving Miss Daisy right and then the next year Kathy Bates won the Academy Award for Misery so basically these were the two biggest fucking stars yeah which is kind of funny right exactly <laughs> yeah so they're huge and so they're they're in the current day um there's there's like a couple other actors in it that i was really excited about uh evelyn's husband is played by an actor named uh, uh garrett sartan um he he's in the Ernest movies okay he's in Ernest goes to jail and Ernest goes to camp well i enjoyed him the actor that i was most excited about was the reverend scroggins who oh, was played by richard real by the uh jump to conclusions matt guy from office space he's a people person (laughs) he's good at dealing with people like it's a good cast yeah it's a really good cast and then we go to the past now the movie does this specifically it doesn't jump around through time nearly as much as the book does no the the weems weekly dot weems is not in it i think we should start up i'm just going to do it right here is this sir not appearing sir not appearing in this film go for it all the black people yeah they're not in it we get sipsy yeah and we get big george a little bit well, Big George is in it. He's, He's in got the like whole movie. He's got like three lines. He's present. Yeah. I'm not saying that's better. <laughs> and Naughty Bird is technically in it. She has no lines. It is. But when they show Railroad Bill, what color are the people in like the shanty towns? White and also black. Yeah. Like but these people also were not white. living together in harmony. And also they weren't white. Well, okay, so now we're suddenly getting into a much bigger thing. I'm so I sorry. was just doing Sir Not Appearing I'm so in this sorry. film. I, well, I thought that was I thought it was relevant. Sir Not Appearing in this film, all the black characters, we don't see any of their we don't stories. We don't see artists, we don't see Jasper, we don't see Willie Boy, nope. we don't see uh uh any of them. Nope. Yeah. Nope. All gone. No. It's it's upsetting. No. And I guess I if if it wasn't for the fact that only the white characters survived and the black characters didn't, you could make a case to me that's like, well, it's a movie. You can't do all the storylines. It's just kind of interesting that only the <laughs> white storylines made it and the black storylines didn't. I mean, in didn't. the book, we even meet like Big George's grandchildren because Evelyn meets one of them in church. Yeah. When she goes to church. Mm-hmm. Like, they're just not in it. Their stories are not told. That is Sir not appearing in this film. And then we have our two other leads. They're and every, so like, pretty. If anyone's seen the cover of this movie. Both like, of them are so pretty. It's four ladies. So we have Iggy Threadgood, who is played by Mary Stuart Masterson. Yes. How do you feel about Mary Stuart Masterson in this movie? I like her style. Yeah, her style's real fucking uh, current. Well, I turned to you at one point and said, babe, would I look good in overalls? And you said, honey, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is a personal taste thing, but I believe what I said to you was no one looks good in overalls. Yeah. Which is an overstatement. It is an overstatement. I think a lot of people look good and feel very comfortable in overalls. We have a friend who looks real good in overalls. No, that's true. Yeah. That's true. We know a good number of people. Uh, Then we have Ruth Jameson, who is played by Mary Louise Parker. Oh, she's very pretty. This is my favorite. This is actually I was excited about because it's our first crossover between, for me, for uh, between West Wing <laughs> and anything that we're looking at. Yeah, I don't think we have explored a Martin Sheen's oeuvre. No, we haven't. Yeah. Uh, Mary Louise Parker is, uh, as you say, very pretty. She's very pretty. Uh, as Ruth and also in everything else that she's in. So these two characters are in it. Now... I want to just address this right off the bat that my sure not appearing in this film is that black people just aren't in it. Yeah. And like we said, all the problems we had with the book are even worse in the movie. (laughs) They're much worse in the movie because all of these black characters, we only see any of them in the context of their relationship with a white character. Well, not only their relationship, but like in the way in which they help white people. Yeah. They are, this is going to be, uh, 
I'm going to say this and I mean this and I, I'm saying this more to start a dialogue than I am to give a definitive answer. Okay. They feel like pets. Yeah. In this movie. Well, I think that's the perspective of the author. Mm -hmm. Like that's not an unusual perspective from someone who is racist and thinks they're not racist, which if, from this time period which is like oh no they're simple like we have to take care of them they're mm -hmm. they're not fully human so we we just need to you know care for our black people and they're so good and they're so loyal yeah and they go through so much for the white characters yeah big george literally gets whipped for iggy and ruth yeah and he's concerned about them right and that would have been a moment where I would have been okay with Big George going, I'm getting whipped. <laughs> save me. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is the moment where you save me yeah, because like, I'm your friend and like I'm part I'm, of your family. It, save me. Not like I'm worried about you getting in trouble, but yes, correct. You should assist me, please. Please, I need assistance. Yeah. <laughs> As a member of this community, I need assistance. And they do assist him, but like, he's overly grateful they don't really assist him they wait for the clan to be done yeah <laughs> and then we find out that he's more worried about them than him right and yeah you can write a character that's really selfless it's, it's just kind of frustrating that all the black characters are like that in yeah, this it's not good it's a problem with the movie it's it's one of these things where it's i feel like it's a combination of things it's a combination of the time in which it was made because it is the early 90s and we've made a i think certainly more progress has been made in 30 years i would hope so we are not done Absolutely, but like their progress has been made, and now we can sit here and have this conversation I would, I would about hope, it. I would hope and assume. Yeah, but it is super problematic. And the other thing is, well, this, it was what we were talking about with the railroad bill scene, where railroad bill I felt was ruined in this movie. A lot of well, I mean, a couple things were ruined in this movie. Yeah, that was one of them. And I don't mean just changed; I mean ruined. Yeah, like spoiled. Yes, like something that was genuinely suspenseful in the book was told immediately. Mm -hmm. The whole story of Frank Bennett, we basically know what happens from the very beginning. We'll get to him in a second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the identity of Railroad Bill, well, we, I, we know from the beginning. Can I talk about that? Yeah. So we find out that Iggy is Railroad Bill super early on because she takes Ruth on the train with her and they both throw stuff out to the community of both white and black folks. Yeah. Like undisguised, looking everyone in the eyes, like fully like, oh, there's Iggy throwing stuff off the train. Yep. And all these black folks are, are looking up at them and just going like, bless you. Yeah. Bless you. And it's so great that they're doing doing this for these people yeah it's i oh it's more complicated than that yeah and this movie doesn't want to examine any of that stuff yeah and it, that and then the railroad bill thing is just gone we don't think about it anymore yeah and it's like a constant thing through the book and then you get that great reveal at the end when you find that it was iggy and it's just such a great thing to learn about her we're already on iggy's side before this happens as viewers yeah we don't need that to make us think iggy's a good person i mean there's an awesome scene in the book mm -hmm. where iggy is out walking with a stump and he's like a, a kid, like 10 maybe. Yep. And Stump like finds a can of beans or something in a bush and says, oh my gosh, Iggy, like, do you think Railroad Bill threw that? Like, oh wow, this is amazing because he's so mysterious. He's like, like you said, he's like Robin Hood. He's like a mythological figure. Yeah. Like, no one knows who he is. And Iggy says, oh, oh, you know, very well might be, but like, let's put that back for the, for those that need it. And like, it talks about how very careful stump is like put it back exactly where it was. And, and I just love that scene because there was a sort of a dramatic irony of us. Actually, we, I think at that point we did know it was Iggy who was railroad bill. Um, yeah, I think so. But it wouldn't be as interesting if it, was implied that everybody knew yeah right yeah because it's not like all the townsfolk are there while the train is going past being tossed these things no the like, idea was Bill that they tosses do it in the off. dead of night when yeah. people are asleep and, and people then they go and find, find it, it. Yeah, yeah exactly so that is ruined yeah. and it bums me out i want to say just one kind of last thing about the way this movie deals with race and by extension the way it deals with toxic masculinity <laughs> i'll get right back to sir not appearing in this film after this this might take a minute. This is a thing that I think movies do. I think a lot of movies come at it from the perspective of, well, we only have an hour and a half, two hours to tell this story. So we need to be very careful about using subtlety because if we're too subtle, it won't work because we don't have enough time to be really subtle. A book does, a TV show does, but a movie doesn't. I don't agree with that, but I think that's a really common view. Would you, would you agree with that? I would that? agree with that. Okay, so... In terms of the way race is dealt with in this movie, we've talked about the clan a number of times. Yes. In the book, like you said, there are sim quote unquote sympathetic characters who are a member of the clan. Yes. 
that's something that I think doesn't necessarily need to be in the movie. But if you're going to make a movie and really lean into the fact that race and race relations are an, should be an important part of this story, don't just take all of those feelings and put it into mustache twirling <laughs> clan members. Yeah. Because basically what you're saying is, well, racism existed, but only in the most vile, villainous form that we can all imagine. That's right. That's but that's right. not how it existed. Racism existed in every facet of people's lives, not just in the South, everywhere. Oh, 100%. And, and still does, but everywhere. And, and I think that's the thing that Fanny Flagg was unwilling to explore because think how many times the N-word is used in this book mm -hmm. by people who are just using it as the term that you use as human beings to refer to black people. Like, no. Many, many, many times. No, no, I agree many times. I don't necessarily agree that she was unaware of what that was doing. I think she was doing that on purpose because it doesn't sound but good. But it's totally unexplored. But it's oh, totally unexplored. Tot but, but like, that's what you're saying. It's like, no, racism is not mustache. Like, if all racists walked around twirling their mustaches and wearing white hoods, it would be fantastic because we would look at them and go, stay away from that person. Right. He is a racist. He is bad. Mm -hmm. But everyone in this town, even the ones that we love and cherish as characters, every single one of them is racist. Mm -hmm. All the white people, I mean, yeah. of course. And that's based on their actions. And... It's because racism is far more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. I think this is exactly what you're saying, yeah. right? And so in the movie, they have Grady, who's the police chief, explicitly saying to Iggy, I'm not in the clan. I would never do that. In the book, he is in the clan because that's what you do if you're a man and you live in this town. They all are in the clan. Right. Right? And there's like a scene where the Georgia clan shows up. Yeah. And he, as a member of the Alabama clan, goes to them and says, you guys got to get out of here. Like, and this they is do. our turf. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how he protects them. So he's like the good clan. It's And it's, you can explore that because it was a real thing. Yeah. That was a real thing. It was thing. a real thing that happened. And you can show something in a way where you can say, yes, this person is better than this other person, but they're also still not good. Right. That is that is a subtle distinction to make. Yes. And I think that's something you can do in a movie. Yeah. But this this movie does not try to do that. That's right. And then the other place where it does it, I mentioned toxic masculinity. Let's talk about Frank Bennett. Okay. I want to start by saying one good thing about Frank Bennett. Okay. He is played by an actor who I think is great. That is not important. It is important. He's played by Nick Searcy, who I think, I love the trajectory that this guy's career went on over the course of like 20 years or like 15, 20 years, because he kind of started out in movies and this was a very early performance from him as someone who is evil. Then a couple of years later, he's the sheriff in The Fugitive, who Tommy Lee Jones yells at in the beginning. And he's not evil. He's just an idiot. Then he was in Justified for like all all the seasons of Justified. Now, he plays I never a U.S. Saw, Marshal. I never saw Justified. Isn't everyone in Justified evil? No. Oh. No. The, like most of the characters are U.S. Marshals who are good at their job. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Like it's Justified's one of my favorite shows. Yeah. It's a great, 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 great show. And and John Avnet directed a bunch of episodes of it. There it is. And Nick Searcy is one of the main characters in it. So I just was really excited that he showed up. So tell me about toxic masculinity. Okay. Frank Bennett is a bad guy. Yes. He beats his wife. Yes. He comes after her and tries to steal a baby. Yes. And beats the woman that works at the Whistle Stop Cafe. And Smokey Lonesome. Yep. Oh, Smokey Lonesome, the hobo, is he's so sweet. Yeah. He was great in the movie. Yeah. I really like Smokey Lonesome in the movie. That was the moment that made me cry. Aww. Um, Yeah, Ruth dying didn't make me cry in the movie. Smokey Lonesome getting punched in the face made you cry? No, Smokey Lonesome being sad after Ruth dies Aww. made me cry because he loves Ruth. And in the book, it's great because Iggy knows that he loves... They each know that they each love Ruth. Yes. And that's the thing they have in common. Yes. And Smokey's really sweet. So Frank Bennett in the movie is beyond evil. Yes. In the book, lots of people think he's great. Oh, yeah. Everyone like, thinks he's great. He's really charismatic. He's wealthy. And people don't believe the things that he did. Right. But in the movie, anyone who sees him with his wife sees how he is being to her. And he's incredibly evil. He, like, pushes his pregnant wife down the stairs in front of other people. Mm -hmm. I did not appreciate that the only way this movie felt like it could show this kind of toxic masculinity was in this really in your face kind of way. Yeah. 
And the problem with toxic masculinity is that it is subtle and you find it everywhere. Right. That's the thing that makes it so scary. Right. So I did not appreciate that. I think right. it I think it oversimplified something that's really awful. Well, and I think that is it's also it, it really does a disservice to let me just think how to put this. Mm-hmm. People who are abusive don't look like the stereotype of what an abuser looks like 99% of the time. Yeah. And it, it really does a disservice to someone who's wondering, am I being abused? If they see something like this, they're like, oh, well, at least I'm not being pushed down the stairs while I'm pregnant. So if that's what abuse is, then clearly what's happening to me is not abuse. Yeah. And because abuse and harassment and whatever are so much more subtle than that, as you say, to to portray well this is what that is and it looks terrible and is instantly recognizable to everyone is is not is not accurate yeah uh, and I it's, bet, it's not realistic i bet the filmmakers would be horrified for me to say this yeah but i feel this so i'm gonna say it say it do you have a story that has four female main characters and one of whom is a victim of domestic violence yes and you've created a movie where there is a really good chance that women who are watching this movie who are themselves in relationships that involve domestic violence are leaving the theater saying, well, what I'm dealing with is not as bad as what Ruth dealt with, so I should just deal with it. Right. And I and, bet they'd be horrified to hear me say that. And and also, wow, he did this terrible thing in front of other people Well, my abuser has done things to me that felt abusive in front of other people but none of them did anything they didn't they didn't come to my rescue they didn't tell him to stop they didn't put me in the car and take me away so clearly this is a problem of my perception and not of this person's behavior yeah like in the and book, i wouldn't just say you said women but i would say anyone yes anyone i'm so sorry about no, that that's fine yeah, yeah, yeah. no I, I appreciate you calling me on that um like in the book ig hears that he's abusive and then she gets a note from Ruth that says, come get me. And she goes immediately. Yeah. She believes Ruth. Yeah. In the movie, it's very much like Ruth is trying to hide this from Iggy. Mm-hmm. And then Iggy sees her shiner. Yeah. And she's like, no, like, no, you got to go. This, this is bad. And then there's a whole fight and he's there and he's fighting with Iggy and he's fighting with Ruth. And then like Big George has to threaten him, which is kind of in the book. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just... There's no subtlety in any of it. Yeah. And oftentimes that's not how life works. Yeah. Mustache twirling is a really good description of what you said before. Yeah. Frank is just an evil character. And I'm one of those people, I don't really think evil really exists in this world. Mm. I think people who do bad things like to say that evil exists because it lets them say, well, I'm not evil. Right. If evil exists, I'm not evil. So I, I must be okay. Yeah. But if you accept that evil doesn't exist and you kind of accept that everyone is capable of really awful things, it forces you to kind of examine your own actions. Then it's just actions. It's yeah. It's just, there's, 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 it's not, I'm evil and therefore I have to do these things because this is an uh, ingrained part of my personality. It's no, it's just actions. It's just mm-hmm. actions that you choose to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's how they treat it. And I don't appreciate that. Yeah. But let's I, move on. I agree with that. That's, I don't really feel like I have that much more to say about the way race is handled in the movie because it really is a problem with both the book and the movie. Yeah. But the movie solves it by just kind of ignoring everything. Right. So it has it has all the same problems that the book has, but even more because it fixes them by ignoring them. Right. And right. that's that's where I stand on that. Right. So that's Sir Not Appearing in this film. Right. That was a long Sir Not Appearing in this film. Yes, it was. Well, there were a lot of people that were not appearing in this so film. so many of them. We have to cover a good amount of people. So many. Well, I guess this might be a good time for me to go into the female characters a little underwritten. I mean, we might as well. Which you might say, all the characters in this movie are women. Most of them. Yeah. How could the female character possibly be underwritten? That's what I would have thought. Well, I'm going to take it back to what we were talking about before. Good. With Iggy and Ruth. Yep. And their relationship. So I'm going to call this the gay female character is a little underwritten. Mm -hmm. So Mary Stuart Masterson is playing up Iggy as like a butch woman. Can I say a quick thing? Yeah. As far as performances go, my only knock against the two of their performances is I think they're in different movies. Yeah. I think I, I think Mary Louise Parker is in a movie. I think Mary Stuart Masterson is in a play. She's she's basically she's basically channeling like talk about Huckleberry Finn. Like she's basically channeling like sort of a Mark Twain yeah. imp of some kind. She's but really I, playing to the back row. But I like it. I, I like her performance. She's very good in and it. And she looks great. Yeah. I just wanted to say that really. Yeah. Quickly. And her costumes are are great. Yep. Just what you would expect. Mm-hmm. Um 
And it's it's just funny because the way that they are costumed and portrayed and really set up is that this is a couple in a relationship. And there's a couple scenes that are a little bit sexy, like not really sexy in terms of like contact between them. But there's a scene where they're both like drunk and sitting in a lake and, and it's wet and wet. And uh, it's, it's great. It's great. Like w- w- it's no more need to be said about it. But the thing that I think is really missing is the way that their relationship is acknowledged by the other people in the town. Yes. Um, it's basically ignored. What I wouldn't have given for one person to refer to Stump as Iggy and Ruth's little boy. Mm-hmm. Like just just so we get that understanding, just like in the book, that the two of them are an established couple and everyone's fine with it. And that didn't happen. And I think the fact that it didn't happen is the source of this weird ambiguity where people seem, because we read a couple of reviews, where people seem really dedicated to this idea that they're just good friends. (laughs) And I don't understand. There is something I want to read. Okay. That was so deeply frustrating for me. And it was frustrating because it was like a top Google result that I found. Mm -hmm. And it's just some jerk's own review on their own blog okay. about fried green tomatoes. In order to talk about it, we have to talk about one other thing. Okay. There is a change that this movie makes that's very subtle. Okay. Not direct, but it certainly changes a certain interpretation of things. Okay. I have a question for you. Yes. In the book, there are two characters, Iggy Threadgood and Ninny Threadgood. Yes. Those are two different characters, right? 100%. And we know that because we see them in the same room together. Yep. And also, Ninny dies. She does. And then later in time, we see that Iggy is still alive. Yes. They, in, in the past, and I know where you're going with this, and I'm glad you're bringing this up. Yeah. In the past, in the book, when we see a scene, the two of them are together in a room having a conversation. Ninny is married to Iggy's brother, which she does mention in the movie. Mm-hmm. They are two different people. Yep. Like, how could her last name be Threadgood and her say... I'm sorry. I'm 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 steamrolling your your point here. So in the movie, w- this kind of shocked me a little bit. It's because I read the book first, so I never was thinking about this at all. Yeah, there is actually ambiguity about whether Ninny and Iggy are different people. They're clearly different people. Are they? Yes. In the movie. Yes. In the movie, though. Yes. What makes it clear that they're different people? Because you see Ninny in flashback. You, you see her. She's there at the wedding. Because according to the director, it is ambiguous. The director's wrong. He wrote it. He didn't write it well. Okay. So... I'm going to... This is the hill I'm going to die on. Okay. So here's the thing. I also believe that they are different people. However, I cannot ignore the fact that this movie is constructed in a way where the there is actually ambiguity around that. No. I appreciate that you do not agree. <laughs> However, I feel pretty strongly about this. I believe there is ambiguity around it. I have a question. Okay. How could her name be Mrs. Cleo Threadgood? Uh Uh-huh. Cleo being Iggy's brother. Yep. And that was her husband. Yep. If she's also Iggy. Okay. How is that possible? This is why I bring it up. This Well, that's my problem with it. I don't think it's good that there's ambiguity. There shouldn't be any ambiguity because it doesn't make sense. Right. But there is actually ambiguity around it. But I did find this. And it's this post that's built on this concept And it's so deeply frustrating. Uh, Basically, here's what they write. Ever since I saw Fried Green Tomatoes many moons ago, I considered it one of my semi-favorite movies. Probably not in my top 10, but definitely in my top 20. However, something has always bothered me about it. So they go on to talk about how the movie implies that Iggy and Ninny Threadgood are the same person. Does not. And he starts to go on this long kind of thing talking about how that's actually super messed up for them to be the same people because it implies that Iggy married her brother, Cleo. What? And that's why their son has the problems that he has. What the fuck? Because Ninny talks about her son, Albert. Yes. Who... He was birth injured. Right. Yeah. And so he's, he's like... He has... He's disabled. He's disabled in a very superficial way. Yeah. It, it's kind in of... In a movie way. In a movie way where no one did any research about how people are actually disabled. Right. Um, so he's simple. He's like a child. Yes. And then he died when he was like 30. Yes. And he basically says, this is why... This is why that their son was messed up. Oh, my God. Because she married her brother. No. Then it goes on. 
While researching this absolutely pointless article, they, they refer to their own article as pointless, I also found out that apparently in the book, Ruth and Iggy are uh, quote-unquote lovers. I'm going to paraphrase this next line. That's just stupid. He uses a worse word that uh, we're not going to say. A, a word that's worse than stupid. I'm trying not to think about whether or not this too was implied in the movie because it might quickly leave my top 20 list. I also felt like the last 45 minutes of my life have been wasted, but I'm going to post this article anyway. Dang it. I should not hit publish on this. Well, sir, you should not have hit publish on this. What the fuck? I love this because the number one comment on this is, you're an idiot. The book is better than the movie, and it didn't imply they were lovers. They were lovers. <laughs> Deal with it. And then there's a beautiful thread of people yelling at this person. but Yelling at the original poster? At the original poster, okay, yeah. Okay, that's good. Not the person who explained what the book was about. No, 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 no. But I, I, I say that to say there are, to kind of tie this back to what I was talking about at the beginning, there are people who can read this in a certain way. And if they want to ignore anything that, me, anything that shows that Ruth and Iggy were in a relationship, the, the I movies... guess you can do that, but having seen the movie, yeah. it's really hard to do. I, I I think I said this to you, mm -hmm. which is I, I really believe that if if this is not something that's on your radar, it would be really easy to ignore. And that's what frustrates me about the movie, that it doesn't go farther. That nobody yeah. that nobody because over and over and over again in the book, other people it's it's the acknowledgement of their relationship by other people that's the thing that's missing because mm -hmm. i feel like i've read lots of reviews of this that are like oh the they they really um they really tone down the gay elements and these are gay characters and they're not really being represented and when we watched it i was like oh this is so gay what are these people talking about and then i then i thought about it some more and it, it's really that acknowledgement of yeah. their relationship by other characters as an established thing that is that is the thing that's missing that would allow someone to totally ignore the fact that this is right in front of their face yeah i think there was an aspect of avnet just being uncomfortable going that far with it yeah and so like here's a quote from him basically saying the sexuality had no interest for me it is what it is or whatever you want to think it is what i wanted to deal with was the was the intimacy i wanted two women who loved each other women seem to be closer to each other than men i'm talking about straight women as well as gay women i think intimacy is the most frightening experience in our lifetime sexual Sexuality has so little to do with it. I mean, you just you just summed up the problem with having a straight man direct this movie. Exactly. Yeah, yep. that's it right there. It's a really privileged position to have yeah. to say something like that. Well, that's again this this comes back to intersectionality. Yeah. Like, oh, sexuality doesn't matter. I, imagine someone saying, "I don't see race. I don't see sexuality." Like, yeah, except this is a story about people whose sexuality drastically informs their identity mm -hmm. and you're just saying oh i don't see it i don't see it it's not important yeah. i really think that there is a better version of this movie to be made to be made i agree with you i would love to see someone else remake this movie like, and do another adaptation of the book and really look at it as a chance to improve upon the book yeah what if you did it like as a series where like every episode was from somebody else's perspective you know like almost like a Rashomon type of thing I feel like I would honestly do you know what would happen what I would miss Ruth and Iggy yeah like, yeah there would be like not enough Ruth, Ruth and Iggy that's the thing I really like about the book is that the chapters are so short mm -hmm. that you really everyone is there all the time yeah you're not going for any long stretch of time without interacting as a reader with evelyn or ninny or ruth or iggy and to be honest with you the one chapter where all of that is missing is one of the least interesting chapters in the book like where we go to birmingham alabama and learn all about artist pv and his life yeah but that still should be there no it should be there i'm not saying it shouldn't but yeah. like those are the most compelling the reason for that is that he's not fully constructed as a character yes not because his story isn't interesting. Right. This is a chance for someone to kind of expand on that. Yeah, the solution isn't to drop it. The solution is to embrace it and expand on Th it. That's right. And that's make right. an improvement to it. That's correct. So in summary, you know, I, yeah, I've said that I have all these problems with it. And I, I think we both have a lot of problems with it. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. But there's also so much in these that I enjoy. The characters are really well written. Really? Yeah. In really? The book, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, like I've said before, I think there is a better version of this movie to be made. 
Yeah. There, this movie does things that I don't appreciate. Um, I don't appreciate in a lot of movies, and I see that in this one. Uh, two, just two things I can think of really quickly. One is the way it uses music. Mm -hmm. um, the composer is Thomas Newman, who I really, really like. It's very emotionally, uh, very emotionally manipulative. The music is. Yeah. Yeah. It, this movie is constantly telling you how to feel yeah. in different oh, scenes. Oh yeah. Oh my god. Like there's a, there are multiple scenes between Evelyn and Ninny in the in the nursing home where Ninny is telling her a story. And it feels way more dramatic than it should because the music is really dramatic. Yeah. But if you really believe in the strength of the performances and the writing, then you don't need that. Yeah. So that I didn't appreciate. I made a note at the beginning, like, I don't like the music in this scene. But when I got to the end, I realized, oh, I don't like the music in the whole movie. <laughs> the other thing the movie does that I don't like is the way it deals with exposition. Mm -hmm. So like we said in the book way back at the beginning, you really hear from multiple narrators. There's Ninny, who's narrating half the story. Mm -hmm. And there is the kind of the omnis omniscient narrator. There's Fanny Flagg, who's telling you the real story of what happened to Iggy and Ruth in, in the past. In this movie, Ninny is the narrator for the whole movie. Yeah. But in the past, characters are constantly talking in exposition. Yeah, like a lot. Like, a, like a, lot, lot, a lot. A lot, a lot. Which bugs me because if you're going to do narration, if you're going to have this person who's there to give exposition, you don't need to make all your characters talk in really stilted exposition. Right. Because you have a narrator. Like you literally have a character go up to another character going, why is this happening? And the other character says, ah, I will tell you all the reasons well, why this is happening. I'm your brother, as you know. Yeah. Like that's... <gasps> I am your mother, and therefore I have the right to tell you this thing. It's constant throughout the whole movie. Yeah. I just think there is a version of this movie that use it, that does less of that, plays around with structure a little bit more, is very willing to address race, is very willing to portray Iggy and Ruth as being in a romantic relationship. Yeah. You could even have done it with these same actors. Like, it's oh, totally. cast really well. Yeah, I blame the script. Yeah. I blame the script and the director. And this is his first time directing a movie, so... And it turns out he had to write the whole script. Yeah, I just feel like I get why people love it. I would never say this is poor or bad. No. I just really believe there's a better version of this to be made. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's why we felt so strongly, because y you can't just dismiss it. We like it, but we think... <laughs> We're not mad. We're just disappointed. Yeah, I wouldn't feel this strongly if I didn't like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just had one other thing I wanted to say that I was thinking that this was, that I was going to say this was Jessica Tandy's last movie. Um, it was not, actually. She had a couple other movies, including two that were released after her death. But this was certainly probably one of the last things she ever shot. And I was literally, as I was trying to frame this in my mind, was about to say, we lost her too young. She was 85 when she died, which is a good long life. Yeah. Um, but uh, she was wonder she's wonderful. I love Jessica Tandy. Um, I was looking at pictures of her last night from when she was young. She was so beautiful mm -hmm. and just such a uh, really just electric personality yeah. and I, I i love her and She's, i didn't know she was british yeah oh that's yeah um you would have known that if you had watched any Alfred Hitchcock pre presents because she's been in a lot of them. Oh, when, really? Yeah, like from the 40s and 50s, though. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really, there's actually another version of this that I would have loved to see. W I would have loved to just see their rehearsals mm. because, like, she and Kathy Bates are stage actors. Yeah. Like, yes, she, she, they've both been in a lot of movies, but the, the sense I really get from them is that they're stage actors. Yeah. And a lot of this could easily have been done as a play. Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I would be shocked if there wasn't a play yeah. version out there somewhere. I, I did not do any research on whether that was true. I, I didn't see anything about that. Yeah. I'd be open to that. Yeah. I think that would be, I think it would make a really good play. Yeah, it would be all right. Yeah. Do you want to do our quadrants and wrap this up? Yeah, let's do, the, let's do some quadrants all right, on this. All right, great. So um, we really only have one adaptation to talk about. Yep. And that is the movie Fried Green Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. On the scale of whether or not they cared about the source material. Yep. Where would you, what would you put them? Absolutely cared. I think so too. Like John Avnet worked on this for years. Yeah. This was a passion project for him. And and you had Fanny Flagg as the credited screenwriter. Oh, yeah. I know you said she didn't actually do a lot of work on it. And she she's a cameo in the movie mm -hmm. as like the leader of the women's, like women's lib class. Right. That, Evelyn goes too. I, I think they absolutely cared. Oh yeah, there's nothing cynical about this movie for me. Yeah. Uh, just because we didn't think that they explored all of the things that needed to be explored doesn't mean that they didn't care about trying to tell the story. It's a case of like reach out, uh, reach uh, exceeding grasp. Yeah. I think. Or no, I actually think it's a case of not reaching far enough. 
No, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. I They played it safe. But they cared. They played it safe, but they cared. And did they make it is it good? <sighs> I I'm uh, always I, hesitant to put things on the line. Yeah, I you know what? This is going to sound funny. Yeah. Because I just spent a whole bunch of time yelling about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's good. Yeah. I like it. I think this is one of these ones where I we really... I enjoyed watching it. We really have to put it in its in its time period. Yeah. Like one thing that we we felt like we were going to talk about but ended up not talking about, so I'm just going to mention it now. <laughs> yeah. But the movie that it really reminded us of was The Joy Luck Club. Yeah, a little bit. It's one of these movies where I just find it such a long shot that any studio would make this movie at all. That's right. With four female main characters of of ages that range from their 20s to their 80s. Well, I, yes, I agree with you. And I, w I would be willing to bet that if the best actress winners of the two previous years had not been a portly middle-aged woman and a very old woman, this would not have been made. You, mm. could not ma you could not have made this movie were it not for the fact that it had roles for people whose demographics happened to fill those roles and were the two biggest stars at the time. Yes, totally. Yeah. Totally. So kind of like the Joy Luck Club, it's good. Yeah. It's good. It is it's, good. It's good. It could have been so much better. Yeah. And we'd love to see a, a, a different version. Right. And But the people really cared who were making it. And the fact that it got made, especially when it got made, is important. Yes. It's important. And I think it's good that it got made. I agree with you. So yeah, I guess this is an upper right one. Yeah. And Why not? It doesn't have to be the far, far upper right no. corner. It can be right over the line. But that's, yeah, that's where we come down on it. Yeah, well, there it is. Did you have anything else you wanted to say? No, I think let's uh, take us out. Well, this has been Adapt or Perish. If you'd like to find us online, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AdaptCast. And if you tweet about the show, don't forget to use the AdaptCast hashtag. You can join our groups on Facebook and Goodreads, and you can also find and follow me on Letterboxd. If you have anything to say that's longer than a tweet, you can always send an email to adapterparishcast at gmail.com. I've said this before, we love getting email. If you'd like to support the show, there are two great ways you can do it. First, tell a friend. Second, a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice would always be greatly appreciated. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, what's up? You're a bee charmer. That's what you are. Oh, that's really, they just love each other so much. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.